Yeah, I'm going to talk about um, some work that's funded by the foundation that I've been doing on uh, Rust support and SEO for user space. <clears throat> so Rust support and SEO for user space has been an official foundation project for uh, about a year since last year's summit. And it's on GitHub. And I've been working on this for about two years, um, thanks to funding from the foundation. And this work primarily consists of a bunch of Rust libraries known as crates. And these include bindings to the SEO4 API, a runtime for root tasks, a runtime for protection domains, and a whole lot more. Um, but there's also a general purpose kernel loader in there, a CapDL based system initializer, Rusty target specs, examples, and tests. The README uh, linked uh, uh, for the repo up, up, up there um, outlines all this too and contains links to relevant documentation. And I've taken special care to organize all this work in a way where you can um, into layers where you could so you can take only what you need and, and leave the rest and um, enter in at any level of the stack. At last year's summit, I introduced this project, and I'm going to touch on some of the stuff that I talked about last year, but um, you can check out the recording for more detail. And this talk, I'm mostly going to focus on what's new and what's next. Um, and I'm going to try to use less than these 15 minutes so that there's a little time for questions at the end. But um, also, I might also just give back some time that I took this morning. So, um, so here's a quick tour of the crates. The most important one is the SEO4 crate, which is just bindings to the SEO4 API. Uh, it's implemented in two layers following a common, pa uh, a common pattern in the Rust ecosystem. We've got the SEO4 sys crate, which is just generated code, and then the SEO4 crate, which wraps that with some nice types and traits to present a clean and ergonomic interface. Um, the SEO4 crate should be considered the real Rust lib SEO4. Uh, the SEO4 crate has minimal dependencies. Uh, it's easy to build. All you have to do is supply cargo, um, the, the Rust uh, build tool, with the lib SEO4 headers using an environment variable, just a single environment variable. Um, it's flexible. For example, you can configure it with or without thread local storage. And it plays nicely with the C lib SEO4 um, in the same executable if necessary for the cases of polyglot binaries which isn't always necessary, but sometimes it is. Um, I've tuned the traits and types in there to be as ergonomic to use as possible, using a few example uh, root tasks as guides. And to give you a sense of what it's like to interact with the SEO4 API using the SEO4 crate, here are some numbers. Um, with no dependencies beyond the SEO4 crate, that is no dynamic libraries or anything like that, um, nothing analogous to um, as what we have in SEO4 libs, just the SEO4 crate. It takes around 300 lines of code to spawn a thread 400 to spawn a task, and 300 to map and drive a serial device. And coming from another operating system, that might seem like a lot of code, but um, we know that in this case, that's, that's not so much. Uh, this project also contains a bunch of crates that serve as modular building blocks for Rust language runtimes. So what I mean by runtime, uh, the elements of a runtime are an entry point, um, a stack, maybe thread local storage, maybe heap allocator, a panic handler, which is a, a Rust specific construct, and then maybe C++ style exception handling, which is supported by Rust, but you don't need to use it. Um, the implementations of some of these elements might, or all of them might depend on the program's environment. Is it a root task? Is it a micro protection domain? Is it something something else? Um, like I mentioned before, I've, I've written all this runtime, uh, like language runtime code to be super modular so you can assemble the basic building blocks into a language runtime suitable for your purpose. I talked about a few of these um, libraries that make up these building blocks last year. But this year, I'm only going to talk about one new one, a kind of fun one called SEO4 Reset. Um, in MicroKit, you can give one protection domain the authority to reset another. But in MicroKit, what reset means is just set its program counter back to its entry point. Um, but in order for that to work out, the protection domain being reset needs a robust and, uh, in some sense, at least trustworthy way to re reinitialize its own state, no matter how corrupted that state was before reset. And the solution here is to modify the binary at build time by stuffing the initial states of all its writable segments into read-only segments and have an entry point that initializes those writable segments from that read-only data and then jumps to the more typical entry point. Um, our implementation also supports data that's explicitly persistent across resets. And this is useful beyond just the microkit protection domain hierarchy case. For example, you could implement 
a runtime with a panic handler that resets itself. And this approach isn't Rust specific, but I, I implemented it in this Rust runtime code. Um, we've been talking about runtime building blocks, um, but there are two fully assemb assembled language runtimes in there, one for root tasks and one for protection domains. Um, I talked a little bit about these last year. They're both highly configurable to suit as many um, applications as possible, and I'll talk about the root task one first. You can configure it um, with or without thread local storage, with or without a heap, and with or without stack unwinding. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a crate, so it's easy to use. You just use the normal um, Rust constructs for building a, a program that can be run as a root task. So here's hello world. Uh, it depends on the root task crate and uh, uses that attribute macro above main to, to declare a function as main. The microkit runtime is similarly configurable and easy to use. It's configurable um, with those same parameters. And we won't dwell on this code, but I will say that it's a little more interesting because it implements the um, microkit protection domain event loop. Um, and to give you a sense of how you hook into that loop, what the way you write a microkit protection domain using um, the that uh, these Rust crates is you write an initialization function called init up there um, that returns an event handler. And there's an example event handler down there. Just, uh, yeah, we won't dwell on this. There are examples in the repo, but yeah, just, uh, you know, leveraging the Rust type system to make things a little easier. Um, beyond language runtime and binding CSCO4 API, there are also, um, in this project, there are also some crates to support higher level code. And in this talk, I'm only gonna highlight a few new things. Um, last year, I talked about support for SDDF shared ring buffers. Um, one recent highlight is the addition of some library layers that check for misbehavior on the other side of the ring buffer, um, enabling defensive clients and servers without really any extra effort. Uh, and also, um, at last year's summit, Ben from Galois presented um, presented some work, and, and we we built on that and uh, merged that and built on it. And what this work is is adapters that take non SEL for specific drivers, um, implemented using tr uh, various traits around the ecosystem. So these might be uh, like gene generic driver code that you can just find online after you give it a nice audit. Um, and uh, so this is kind of uh, utilities and code infrastructure to automatically turn these uh, non SEL4 specific drivers um, into microkit driver protection domains using SDDF interfaces. Uh, last year, I talked about async Rust and how this project supports its use in SEL4 user space. I think this is a, a great uh, um, benefit Rust can provide SEL4 user space. Uh, I presented a web, a web server example that stitched everything together um, to implement a concurrent web server in a single SEO4 thread. And I demonstrated server green threads leveraging async Rust to serve web pages using uh, sequential looking code. But the event loop at the core of that web server protection domain was a one-off ad hoc piece of code. Um, but one of the promises of Lions OS is to provide us with the building blocks for systems exactly like this one and, um, and the whole range of others. One piece of upcoming work that I'm excited about is adding support for Lions OS applications written in Rust. That's the kind of environment that we can write reusable async Rust executors for. Um, and that'll entail putting together async runtime that connects all the interfaces that are available to Lions OS applications. Um, this is not as interesting, but something maybe that might be useful to folks who have been using this stuff is uh, I created a test harness for running first or third party tests in an SEO4 root task uh, that could be adapted for other SEO4 user space, user space environments. And the kind of, the, the use case that motivated this for me that, that might demonstrate why this is useful is I wanted to run a crypto crates, uh, a third party crypto libraries unit tests, but with the, not on my host, I wanted to ru run the tests for the code uh, as it would be configured in my use case, um, which was an SEO4 user space. So that kind of thing is useful. It just hooks into the uh, Rust unit testing infrastructure. 
Um, now I'll talk, take just a few minutes to talk about achieving assurance um, for Rust code and SFO user space, because of, co of course, in general, I'm talking about applying Rust to unverified SFO user space code, uh, great for rapid development, prototyping, um, developing rich components that aren't amenable to verification or for which verification isn't in scope yet. But as you can imagine, the Rust community is um, building out tools to support verification of Rust code. Um, of course, it's nothing like what, for example, we have in L4V. It's just a different kind of thing, but uh, there are still tools that we can use. So first off, on the, um, on the tool chain side, about a year ago, uh, I guess this isn't really to formal verification, but it's still relevant. On the Rust toolchain side, a Rust toolchain based very closely on the upstream toolchain received um, those qualifications for use in safety critical automotive applications, and um, you can benefit from this with no extra effort uh, using this project because our libraries are compatible with this toolchain. Um, and on the verification side, at last year's summit, Mikal from Galois talked about Kani. Kani is a verification tool for Rust from AWS. And this snippet from the Kani docs uh, shows what symbolic execution um, with Kani looks like. That variable input up there is symbolic, and Kani uses model checking to verify that the assertion at the bottom um, would be true for all possible values of input. Um, this tool is, is nice, and it's under active development, and it's pretty easy to use. And uh, right now, we use it to verify certain aspects of capability, invocation, message, marshalling, and unmarshalling in the SEO for sys crate, that lower level um, crate, um, and we plan to use it uh, for more in the future. Uh, Veris, on the other hand, is a much more heavyweight tool from CMU. Uh, it's, it's really cool and also under active de development. It's really more like a language based on Rust and implemented in like a layer just on top of Rust. Because of how it works, at least for now, um, Seems like it's more suitable for downstream crates rather than the upstream crates in this project, but it's, it's on our radar, and I've personally been contributing improvements to Veris to make it easier to work with, with SEO for user space in mind, um, so that there's somewhere for folks who are hoping to use, um, to you know, leverage Veris with the, um, the code in this project to give them kind of a, a landing pad to do that, um, because I, th I think it, it will be really useful. Um, Veris is inspired uh, in part by Daphne, which is uh, a separate verification-aware programming language. And I was thinking, if Daphne is so great, can we also run Daphne programs in SQL4 user space? And Daphne compiles down other programming languages, and it, it does target Rust, so yes, we can. Um, I was able to use the Rust libraries in this project the, to support the Daphne language runtime without any trouble at all. Um, and so that leads me into a wider topic about one use of Rust and SEO for user space that I'm excited about. Um, Rust is uh, Rust is low level enough to support other language runtimes. I mentioned Daphne. Um, I've also experimented with using Rust to support an OCaml runtime for running Mirage OS unikernels in SEO for user space. Um, we can also use Rust behind a libc like newlib or muscle to support C. Um, and I don't think I really have time to talk so much about this, but we have, uh, but you can also use lower level Rust to support um, non nostood Rust code, that is Rust applications that use libstood. And I'm not going to go into all this because I don't have time. I don't think it's interesting enough to uh, take up time that could be used for maybe a question or one and a half questions or something. Um, but yeah, I'm just not going to talk about that. Um, yeah. Uh, so. One thing on the roadmap that I want to mention is stabilization. We'll collect some more feedback, minimize and tighten the interfaces between libraries, and then host them on crates.io eventually to improve the ergonomics of depending on them. And that's, uh, that's what I have. Uh, please use this stuff and reach out with questions. And don't be shy with feedback. Um, you can reach out to me personally or open issues, PRs, anything. Um, part of my job is to like support adoption. So yeah.